Oh, okay. You shouldn't talk when I'm talking. I hate it when I'm interrupting and someone keeps talking. This is Control Structure, episode 142 for April 18th, 2018. Big week to everyone listening. This show has notes. Visit the Nexus. Dot tv slash cs142 to see them. I'm your host, Stephen Orvis, and with me is the other host, Andrew Bailey. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Stephen. It's been a while. It has been a while. Very long while since we've done a Skype one, even. Yes. In fact, uh, kind of had a little bit of a problem uh, figuring out how in the world to record these things. And it turns out I needed to download old versions of things. I'm surprised the old version of Skype even worked. Quite often it's not compatible. Yeah, but uh, hey, we're not here to discuss Skype. We're here to discuss things like Raspberry. Raspberry? 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 Raspberry! I have a family in my house, so they would not appreciate. So, So you're not in your shack right now? I'm not in my shack. Ah, too bad. Yes, in my shack, I'll have a few hundred yards buffer for screaming. <laughs> so, apparently, uh, uh, what is Jeff, I think his last name here, Jeff Gerling, is that, that right? Gerling, yeah. Gerling, he did a test of uh, SD cards for your Raspberry Pi to find out what is fastest. And it seems like, just scanning through, the SanDisk Ultra was the fastest. Up oh, Windows Samsung Evolve Plus was just a slightly faster. They're all pretty fast, really, uh, from that perspective. So, yeah, again, it depends on what exactly you're trying to use it for. Mm-hmm. And, That's true. Yeah, so, uh, you know, generally the uh, Samsung ones were pretty good for everything, and the higher end uh, SanDisk as well. The interesting tidbit that I had it known before was apparently you can overclock the card reader within the Pi. It says it's really not something you'd notice, but just because you won't notice it doesn't mean that people won't do it. Yep. So, didn't know you could overclock your Pi. Yes. More Pi. So, and now for this episode's LOL Apple. You know, you're just uh, clicking along there with your uh, Mac operating system because, you know, you've just switched over from Windows or Linux or what have you uh, because you were lured lured in by the promises of things just working. And then you get a little pop-up the other day about saying that this application will no longer be supported because it's a 32-bit application and you better upgrade. Uh, or rather get a uh, new version of this application uh, because it's not going to be supported before too long and you're going to be required to have a 64-bit version of all your programs. Somehow I feel like if Windows did that, like right now, they wouldn't get away with it. Uh, Yeah, Um, things would start to burn. Uh Uh, All the ATMs would stop working. um, That and... uh, uh, let's see, like, people would get death threats because of it. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. I think the more controlled ecosystem lets Mac maybe put that pressure on. It's interesting, the error message very much uh, points them to go whine to the developer. It's like, this app needs to be updated by its developer to improve compatibility. It's not optimized for your Mac. Yes. Uh, so... Like, even in the Windows ecosystem, uh, most of the commonly used applications have migrated over to 64-bit, but then you still have things like games that don't really uh, have new versions of them come out. Yeah. Uh, So, like, if you want... Then again, you know, anything in the Apple ecosystem, you know, if if it's not new within the past, like, two or three years... Uh, you can pretty much forget about it. Like, the ecosystem cannot be bothered to support things older than, like, three years or so. That's a bit of proprietary Apple attacks. Yes. You must always be up to date. Um, 
So instead of putting the heat on uh, those application developers, uh, instead, Hell is feeling much colder today uh, because Microsoft is releasing its own Linux distribution. Uh, Microsoft uh, announced the launch of a secure end-to-end Internet of Things product that focuses on microcontroller-based devices. So these are things like your light bulbs, your light switches, uh, your remote-controlled garage door opener, uh, you know, small things like that instead of, like, say, a server. Uh, Microsoft is not exactly getting into the uh, server Linux distribution business, uh, I guess because they already have, like, the Microsoft Azure thing, and they already support uh, Linux, other people's Linux distributions on those. So it's just the high-level concept of why Microsoft did this. When I scanned the article, I was getting the sense that it was somehow related to their – they wanted the performance that you'd get with the Linux distro versus like a full-fledged Windows sitting there. So I guess this is sort of an underhanded admission that uh, Windows is a little bit too thick uh, or a little bit too heavy uh, for this kind of uh, hardware. It's also another step into how Microsoft's – getting less of forcing you to always use the windows and uh admitting that sometimes linux is better which they've been doing i uh, quite a lot lately i uh, is getting into the service aspect of of selling products yeah and uh i think we've said that hell has frozen over quite a bit before right they have done a lot of stuff like the open source and the dotnet framework like, that was a pretty big one oh and that's yeah been nice like i've used that a lot just the ability to go jump into the .NET framework and see how some of those functions work, like that's been useful a few different times I've gone and looked to see what it did. So, uh, speaking about Windows, uh, Windows can be unstable uh, when using 7-Zip with large memory pages. Uh, so if you've ever you know, compressed something with 7-Zip and poked in the advanced options, you might have seen something called uh, large page support. Uh, so apparently if you do that, uh, you're kind of risking, uh, stuff. Uh, so, uh, if you, uh, run the 7-zip benchmark, uh, works incorrectly with large pages, you can just get a decoder error message, you can crash 7-zip, or you can bring down the whole system. Your choice. Thank you, Windows. Thanks, Microsoft. Uh... So I guess this really isn't a, uh, you know, I guess not a well-tested feature. Uh, or uh, as this uh, thread kind of notes here at some point, that uh, it's mostly designed for server applications where, like, they allocate all their memory up front and, like, never allocate more again. mm so, like, I'm not exactly sure how large memory pages work or why you would want them, but apparently they're good for performance in some cases. That's interesting. So, uh, we have, uh, you know, like we said, I don't know how how long ago, another episode, another security vulnerability. Uh, remember Spectre and Meltdown? Those would be the ones, if I'm guessing right the ones that the processors said that would uh yes yep okay. yeah yeah the uh was it the out of order execution yes. and speculative execution uh so branch scope and specter 2 uh are new vulnerabilities uh that exploit the branch target buffer uh which uh how should I say this it's how should I say it stores the previous execution data that decides you know whether a branch is generally taken or generally not taken. Uh, so this is like sort of like your branch predictor thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so somehow I I haven't really looked at this too closely because this is like really low level stuff. Uh, but you know this is possible you know to you know do a timing attack uh on that so yeah interesting all the different holes we've gotten ourselves into by speeding things up yep and uh then we just have to slow things right back down again so uh 
I've come across several of these uh, warranty void if removed stickers. It's those green ones that just kind of have the oval around them. It says warranty void if removed. Well, they, they come in all sorts of different shapes and colors, uh, but you generally get a bad feeling if you uh, destroy them. But then again, like the warranty is probably not going to be honored anyway. Uh, that even... was always what I thought. When I was breaking through the sticker, I was like, yeah, but that warranty. <laughs> so uh, apparently the FTC recently went around and uh, told companies that those stickers are probably illegal uh, because federal law says that you can repair your own things and manufacturers cannot force you to use their own repair services, which really runs straight up against the uh, common uh, consumer electronics mantra of the past, I don't know, 10, 15 years uh, that more or less require you to go back to the company to perform repairs. That's a good thing finally the government has at least done something decent. Yes. You can own your own stuff. So, you know, it's not known who exactly... uh, that the FTC gave these warnings to, but it's a safe bet that it includes uh, console manufacturers, like like game console manufacturers. So, um, remember last year when I built my Ryzen uh, system? Uh, yes, is that when we did the build video and uh, yeah. we went through and looked at all this stuff. Yes. Uh, so, uh, AMD has come around, uh, is imminently releasing, uh, in fact, it will be tomorrow, probably, uh, the Ryzen Zen Plus uh, CPUs. Uh, Mind you, this is not the Zen 2, this is just the Zen Plus. So this is not really a whole new uh, design, but it's like kind of tweaked in uh, here and there. And uh, we have some benchmarks, uh, which, you know, it actually looks pretty good, uh, mostly because the uh, the CPU speed uh, is sort of pretty much improved. Uh, so, uh, well, rather the, uh, especially the turbo clocks anyway. Uh, so my 1800X has a base speed of 3.6 gigahertz and can turbo up to 4.0. Uh, the Ryzen 7 2700X uh, base at 3.7 and can turbo to 4.35 so that's pretty you know far ahead so um i've also heard that uh they can overclock over like five gigahertz or so oh wow really? yeah yeah uh whereas like all the all the existing ryzen cpus pretty much you know top out at four five's pretty fast yeah so I guess I'll have to uh, put this, uh, put that article in there. But yeah, it, uh, it's pretty good. So Cloudflare, uh, you know, the new DNS people, mm-hmm. have decided to launch uh, 1.1.1. It's a new privacy-first uh, DNS service. So, you know, DNS is the magical uh, phone book of the internet that converts google.com into the numerical IP address so your computer will know what uh, address to send your request off to uh, when you want to look at Google or get spied on by Facebook or whatever. So uh, It was the the naming of the 1.1.1. They were pointing out the article that that's going to be a super mem- memorable uh IP address for the DNS, so if you're looking for your DNS, you don't have to go Google the thing, which I've done before for the open DNS. I know I've had to hunt oh, yeah. to find their DNS, and it's kind of hard to find, whereas this one is super easy to remember. Yeah, uh, so you know, this is with, uh, this DNS server is, well, server servers, I guess, because it probably uses like any cast, uh, but uh, this is has like quite a bit of security features already on onto it, and I think I might actually step away from Open DNS. Be worth a look and kind of see what they've done. They obviously felt that there was a, a need. Yeah. 
Uh, but apparently that does not work too well on some AT&T gateways uh, because it uses the 1 slash 24 block somewhere internally. Uh, so any request going off to 1.1.1.1 uh, gets lost and uh, never actually comes back with a DNS reply because it just disappears somewhere inside and uh, you know doesn't really come back out. I was just reading through the article some more. Who is saying about the blocking of governments and and uh, to block people? And this is that some people spray paint in DNS IP addresses, yeah, and like walls so people could find it. Yep, <laughs> that's really funny. And then and then they made a stencil for the uh, the four ones. <laughs> so yeah, Viva la Revolution. Definitely easy to remember. <laughs> so, uh, remember the uh, Have I Been Pwned uh, hashes? Yes. Big uh, hash of all kinds of passwords. Uh, and uh, remember how uh, we, I believe it was on the last episode, we uh, had the version 2? Mm-hmm. Well, apparently almost 500 million of those have been cracked and are available for download. So by correct, meaning someone ran through the hashes and found their matching plaintext version of that database. Yes. So, you know, again, because of uh, SHA-1, you know, it's not exactly very uh, uh, secure, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, again, SSHA-1 is, uh, you know, more or less designed for speed because you're hashing, you know, quite a large document. Uh, or say, you know, like a ISO image or like a disk image or something. You want it to hash in quite a mm. fast, you know, quite a good bit of time. Uh, whereas a password, you kind of want to, uh, you know, discourage speed. I think the, the point of that original database was those passwords were kind of already available anyways. He just aggregated them from a bunch of different places. Yep. Exactly. So they, it's not that they haven't been on the internet before. So why would you want to hack someone when they'll probably give away their forgot password answer if you ask? So, you know, this uh, goes on the uh, Facebook thing a little bit, mm -hmm. or at least social media in general. And, uh, you know, it's like those weird uh, questions of, for instance, you know, what what's your first car? Uh, or where did you grow up? Is there like any kind of special memories you have about the place where you grew up? Uh, or, you know, what's, you know, what's your favorite pet? You see, that's the, uh, the people love those Facebook, uh, posts of like, oh, like if you this or that, and then give all the answers. And that's just like a, a bot stream to go scrape all that data and then dump it in a database and use it for brute force. Yep. So, uh, when the Facebook application asks for permissions to access everything, uh, it sucks it all up and keeps it even if it's deleted. Uh, so, uh, a Rails developer uh, went and downloaded his, uh, you know, his Facebook data and shows his entire call history with uh, my partner's mom. Uh, his, a historical record of every single contact on my phone, including ones I no longer have. Uh, yeah, so it sucks it up and keeps mm -hmm. it and doesn't give anything back. Uh, and that's data it should never be asking, t taking out of your phone. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's a reason why Facebook asks for permission for everything, because it wants to suck up everything into its massive data maw. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, like all those URL shorteners? Yes, it makes it so handy when I want to send a link to someone and I can disguise, disguise the link and then they click it and then, uh, you know, it's, it's just so much easier to get them to click it. Yeah. Uh, why shorten a URL when you can just make it as shady as hell? So your example the URL there was this year. It was uh, www.5z8.info slash inject now underscore A0Z1F ninjas uh, routlet. Ninja star outlet. Ninja star outlet. And that goes to my blog. 
I'm I, I don't know if I want to click the link though. <laughs> it it does. <laughs> so uh yeah. This uh you know pretty much does the URL shortener thing but injects some you know words that make some it kind humor. of yeah, that make it kind of embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> and and the uh like the interface to it you know kind of looks like it's from the 90s <laughs> it does so uh one of the things that i've always wanted to one of the things that's always annoyed me about pdfs is that the viewer almost never uh has a default zoom level that i like so, like, whenever you open a PDF and something, you always have to, like, zoom in or zoom out in order to make it just right, you know? Mm-hmm, I know, because you have to open it up, you have to go click on it and all that. Uh, but now with pretty much every web browser having uh, a PDF viewer built into it, you more or less just need a web browser these days. Uh, so, f- uh, for instance, Firefox has, like, some sort of, like, automatic zoom by default, which I can't tell what exactly that means. Uh, it's like, it doesn't fit the page, like, onto the screen exactly, and, like, I think it's, like, a weird zoom level of, like, not quite 125% sometimes. So, I finally figured out how to change that. And I found the uh, Mozilla Forms question about this. And you pretty much go into your about config, uh, look up a uh, preference in there, and change it. Uh, so, like, if it's not a numerical value, it's lowercase with hyphens instead of case instead of spaces. So, in- if you want to zoom to say page width, it's page dash width that you would set this uh, uh, you would set this preference to. All kinds of stuff hidden in that about config. Yes. And I would like to appreciate Payara 5, uh, which is the, uh, how should I say, the latest fork of Glassfish. Uh, so when Glassfish 5 came out uh, uh, several months ago, like I was kind of excited because it had HTTP2 functionality. So like the big thing about that was is that uh, the browser connection stays open, for each subsequent uh, content request. So, for instance, if your page has a CSS file and a few images that are all hosted on the same server, that that connection just stays open. Whereas with HTTP 1.1, you would have to open up a different connection for every single one of those. Uh, And because I have uh, SSL or TLS, whatever you want to call it, uh, it's it's secured. That involves a few more round trips. So with HTTP two, like all those extra round trips for you know the the TLS handshake and the TCP handshake, all that is gone. It's just one of those, and it all comes over the same pipe, which makes things faster. Faster is good. Yes. So. Uh, unfortunately, due to some misplaced startup scripts, uh, my blog got downgraded from Glassfish 5 to 4. And I noticed that when a website speed tester said that my blog no longer used HTTP 2. Uh, so is that, that an automatic test you have running, running, or you just happen to scan it and notice? I was just curious so, okay. you know, whether things got better. Uh, so I'm like, well... I need to fix that. So, you know, the obvious thing would be, you know, figure out why Glassfish 5 isn't running anymore. But wait, wasn't I using Payara at some point? And uh, apparently they had uh, just released a new version about a month ago. So I downloaded that and set everything up. And uh, yeah, now it's uh, just speeding along. Very nice. And uh, we haven't had a Kickstarter in a while. Uh, so, uh, you, some of you might remember, uh, the game Mist, which, uh, is a very old game. It's like 25 years old. In fact, it's, 
pretty much exactly 25 years old because Cyan Worlds, the people behind the series, uh, are doing a Kickstarter to celebrate the 25th anniversary. Uh, and it looks like they have some uh, pretty interesting memorabilia and uh, collector's items for this, uh, along with uh, pretty much a seven-game package, including uh, the Mist Masterpiece Edition, uh, Riven, which is like Mist 2, uh, Mist 3, Mist 4, Mist 5, Mist Uru, which is kind of like a spin-off, and Real Mist Masterpiece Edition. Real Mist being like a full, fully realized 3D version. Because if you played the first game, uh, it's pretty much a series of images. Um, you, if it were made today, you would probably want to make it in a browser. Like, even back in the day, you pretty much could do that. Uh, so anyway, you get, you know, these, you know, like all of these games, uh, you know, in a neat collection. And, uh, yeah, happy birthday, Mist. This is at the nexus.next, episode 100 and something. I didn't know it was loaded. On Friday, whenever, 2018. And now we're all posers. This episode at the nexus.next is hosted by Steve Norvis and Andrew Bailey. Hi, Andrew. Do you have Hi, something to tell us? Yes. So, about two weeks ago, my uh, old creaky phone, my Moto E, uh, decided that it would not uh, accept touch input anymore. Which, for a smartphone, is pretty bad. It means you can't use it. Uh, but over the past month or so, it would intermittently stop responding to touch. And because the screen was kind of loose, uh, like it would creak out, it would kind of like open out like a door, and it was like stuck on one edge. It would occasionally flip open like a door. And if it would stop responding to touch, I would more or less press the screen together. And it would work after that. But after about two weeks, uh, about two weeks ago, it decided it wasn't going to have any of that. It decided to stop responding to touch altogether. So, you know, I decided to press the screen together again and like maybe lift up the other side a little bit, keep pressing it. And, uh, I accidentally ripped the ribbon cable underneath. Oops. Uh, yeah. So, it wasn't coming on at all. So, uh, I'm like, okay, well, I guess I better get a new phone and fast. And, uh, because my old phone had a whole bunch of, uh, Verizon applications, uh, like, baked into it, you know, like those pre-installed bloatware stuff, you know, like, I'd never used those. Uh, you know, this is a Google phone, or rather, this is Android with the Google stuff in it. Just use the Google stuff. You know, like, I don't need another, uh, you know, Maps application. You know, I don't, I didn't even use the Verizon account app, okay? Like, I just did it uh, on my desktop. So, I'm like, well, I think my best bet to avoid that would be get the phone somewhere else, uh, outside of Verizon, and then just go to the store and have them activate it. So I'm like, okay, uh, good call. Uh, so I eventually ended up walking the aisles of hell, uh, Best Buy, uh, and, uh, you know, was looking around there and, uh, got a Moto X4. Uh, you know, I asked the guy, well, well, do you have sort of, uh, you know, maybe a mid-range or sort of a cheaper phone that has uh, Android Oreo on it. And uh, I got this Moto X4 uh, for uh, 299 uh, which was apparently $100 off. So which uh, generation is it? Uh, generation as far as... I mean, it has uh, uh, Android 8 on it. Okay. Uh, I was... That is... That is after. Oh yes, I, so it's fourth generation. I see. Yeah, I was looking it up. Yeah. So as far as uh, you know, when I got home, like it still had Android Seven on it. But then, like once I uh, 
uh, you know, connected it to the FBI surveillance van. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> that it, uh, you know, pretty much immediately updated to uh, Android 8. Uh, so, yeah, I can finally, uh, you know, it can actually update and I can still do stuff on it. It's great. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it doesn't have any of the uh, Verizon uh, apps on it. So that's good. And uh, it has... It has some, uh, like, more Google stuff baked into it, like this, uh, uh, I think it's called Duo, Google Duo, which oh, I, yes. I guess is, like, some kind of video application, uh, like, a video chat application. I installed it once, but no one would talk to me on it, so I was like, fine. So, uh, the camera on it is uh, pretty good. It's definitely a step up uh, from my uh, Moto E uh, it has like this sort of like neat uh, dual camera design. How does that work? I guess it's just there to improve image quality. It's oh okay, so it's it, improving it. Okay, yeah, it's. It, I don't think it's like a three D type of deal. Okay. So, uh, but yeah, I got the uh, the black uh, version of it, and uh, I ordered a sort of like a clear silicone case. So. So. The online, they're saying that you should have a 3,000 milliamp battery. How, how long does it last for you? Uh, so under very, very light usage, which means I pretty much have it in, in pretty much in sleep mode all the time. Mm -hmm. And I disable Wi-Fi uh, on sleep. Uh, and, you know, I'm not one of those people who constantly uses their phone all day, every day. Uh, the battery for me lasts about four days. About three or four days. Very nice. I have a E4, and that one, if you're, like you said, the, the Wi-Fi is off and stuff, I can maybe get three days out of it. A little bit past, but not much more. Yeah. So uh, with the improvement, you know, with uh, Android 8 versus Android 5 I had on the other one, that uh, the permission system is a little bit more fine-grained. It's not an all-or-nothing for applications. Uh, so uh, the other thing is that, uh, like, I'm not sure if I can root this, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the one thing that I want to set up is uh, the, uh, was it the Google Authenticator? What's the Google Authenticator? It's that uh, timed one-time password. Oh, we talked about it last time, didn't we? Yes. Yes, there you go. Got it now. Uh, so, because, unfortunately, uh, I, I could not uh, access the data, like, even before. Uh, but I still have those, uh, like, those keys uh, in my uh, password manager on my desktop. So, all I would have to do is, like, convert those to, was it... Uh, QR codes and scan those. Um, so yeah, you know I'm pretty much you know lightly using this phone like I would uh, you know the others or the this old one phone. That's good for you. You got got an octa core in there. So that's pretty impressive. Just think back early 2000s, we would have thought that it was a pretty cool computer. Yeah, I, well, pretty cool in the fact that you know even like we didn't even had quad cores back then. Mm hmm. Exactly. That's one of the things that has struck me with the phones is the the power that's in the phones and what years ago that would have been been to us just like the specs on it would have been pretty impressive. So so yeah, this has uh, also has three gigabytes of RAM in it. Three's an odd number. Yeah, uh, like I'm not sure if it's a 64 bit or not, uh, but uh, yeah, it uh, you know it's it's fast, it's smooth, it's well. As of the last time that I used it, uh, a lot faster than that, uh, the Moto E, that is. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, hopefully this uh, phone will be uh, supported for quite a bit longer than that was. Uh, you know, one of the things with uh, Android 8 is the, uh, like, that hardware abstraction layer that allows, you know, uh, hardware vendors to more or less write their drivers once. And then the operating system will use a consistent interface to that. So when oh, you... so instead of uh, like putting it right into the operating system, they're just doing a layer underneath it for that more... operating system to use. Uh, more or less. Uh, so like the same driver can be used across you know future uh, versions. Oh, okay, that's nice. 
So uh, I'm, a, you know, how should I say, a little disappointed in that the screen is just a little tiny bit bigger than the, than my old one, which makes the phone, like, I don't know, like half an inch uh, bigger. Not quite as good for the pocket. So, but it, it fits easily in there. Uh, but I really like the fact that it's a 1080p screen, so it has uh, quite a bit of pixel density in there. Ah, very nice. Yes. So, yeah, uh, if uh, you're in the market for a new phone and you don't really have, uh, I don't know, $800 to burn on, say, a Google Pixel, uh, this is, I think, a good buy. It uh, also has a uh, 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi capability. So, yeah. But it's getting quite a bit better these days. Yeah. So, um, if you have uh, feedback for this show, uh, you can go ahead and do that on the Nexus.tv, uh, right below our pretty faces. And don't forget that today is International Backup Awareness Day, so back up your phones before you, before you break the ribbon on the screen. So, um... Yeah, pretty good show, I think. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I guess Yins are still looking for uh, uh, new hires. Yes, we actually are anticipating to have a contract signed uh, sometime soonish and be hiring lots of people. Ooh, lots. Like multiples of tens. Ooh. So, uh, yeah, we're pretty much looking for like another four people. So uh, my uh, sort of project manager from uh, Kansas City came out uh, last week and, uh, you know, did the yearly review Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, also talked a little bit about, yeah, we know that your guys, you guys are, uh, you know, pretty kind of struggling. And yes, we're, you know, we're working on that. And, you know, like the team lead, he's been, you know, uh, working on that a little bit, and it's like, yeah, I I remember him, uh, you know, interviewing a few people, you know, stepping away to interview a few yeah. people. That is, so, yep, it's good good to at least see them recognizing that versus the answer of, oh well, you guys just need to work harder if you're not getting <laughs> it done. Yep. So, all right. So I guess that's it. So, yep. watch for cars. <laughs> okay, we see you. <laughs>